Hi, this is Amy Prowal with the PolyBio Podcast. And my guest today is Dr. James Heath. And he's president and professor at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle and professor of molecular and medical pharmacology at UCLA. And he has directed the National Cancer Institute funded NSB Cancer Center since 2005. And he's also founded or co-founded several biotech companies. And recently he was the lead author of a large study that used a range of advanced technologies to characterize biological factors that predispose to development of long COVID. With that, Jim, welcome. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Great. Well, I mentioned that study, which came out recently and was really illuminated, um, illuminated some key biological factors that may uh, seem to contribute to development of long COVID. Can you tell me more about the study? Yeah, so we... Um... I don't know, back in March of 2020, or, you know, seems like decades ago, uh, we launched a study, um, a large patient study to try to understand COVID-19. This was right at the very start of the pandemic. And our goal was to follow patients from uh, as soon as we could, uh, basically when they were initially diagnosed out through recovery, uh, two to three months later. At the time, I don't think any of us were contemplating long COVID as an issue. Um, and, um, and we, you know, in fact, did study a lot of uh, details about uh, COVID-19 infection. We, we reported that in a cell paper or something like a year and a half ago. Um, and at about the time we reported that, I think that was probably December of 2020 or something like that, long COVID was beginning to emerge as something that in retrospect, I think many of us, you know, might have expected it because you see this kind of thing with sepsis, you see this kind of thing with Lyme disease, um, even uh, chemo brain. There's lots and lots of chronic conditions that evolve after some sort of immune insult. And, um, and so we decided to see if we couldn't um, mine our data and, um, you know, and the patients that we had, had, had uh, gotten to consent to our study um, to understand a little bit more about long COVID. Um, so not necessarily a planned study, uh, more of an opportunistic one, it turns out. Um, but at the time, you know, I think when we started this pandemic, you could argue that probably oncology type studies were about as deep of a study as, uh, uh, and scientifically as was done. Um, but by December of 2020, COVID-19 was becoming the best studied of, <laughs> of all diseases. Um, and so a number of things had happened, uh, had been found um, that were found to be very important for impacting, I guess, a, a patient's, what, what a physician might call a, a patient's disease journey, you know, how they experience and, and recover from COVID-19. One of those was autoantibodies, um, which turned out to be, you know, figures pretty predominantly. Um, there had been one report, and it was an indirect report that said that um, latent viruses, uh, viruses that basically all of us may, you know, have a, a few of these in our body, but they're not active, um, might get reactivated by COVID. Um, and then, um, and I think another measurement we tried to do is a lot of us in the scientific community really were not convinced that the measurement of the viral load through nasal swabs was that accurate. It's just basically the viral load in the nose. It doesn't tell you much about it in the body. Um, and so we had, over, the, uh, over that previous year, been trying to develop ways to identify SARS-CoV-2 um, RNA signatures in the blood. So a lot of stuff we had, and then we did crazy deep analysis in that paper with all kinds of other uh, immunological findings. Um, and, um, and when we went looking, so, so let's say we've got 200 patients, we see them at diagnosis. Some of them are mildly infected. Some of them very severely infected, but they, they tend to recover. Um, and so by the time they're at you know, two to three months out, 
most of them had recovered from COVID. And you could see this by the fact they had protective antibodies. They no longer had the respiratory symptoms of COVID, things like this. But a very large percent of them were having what we now recognize as long COVID symptoms. And these are all over the map. I think, you know, anyone who's been reading in the literature on long COVID knows that it could be, you know, it could be brain fog, it could be cardiac issues, it could be respiratory issues, uh, you know, it, it just go, it could be inability to exercise, many things. Um, so we had, in these patients, we had looked at, uh, we've done very deep single cell analysis of their T cells, B cells, uh, other types of immune cells, anything floating around in the blood, we had measured you know, on the order of 20,000 measurements per cell. So crazy deep. We had looked at their whole genome. We had looked at um, about 1,000 metabolites, many hundred proteins, on and on and on. Um, and so when we looked at these symptoms that patients had when they were um, sort of recovered from disease but still had some chronic ailments, um, it turned out remarkably little of what we were measuring actually correlated with the symptoms the patients were reporting. And that was to us very surprising. Uh, we could find a little bit. And, and in fact, um, two of the findings we had, which I think are actually pretty important. And um, I'll, I'll provide some context there. So if you talk to patients that have long COVID or they have post-acute Lyme or the, you know whatever, any of these chronic conditions, they have a common complaint in that they go to the physician and the physician says, well, what's wrong? And they're tired, they have chronic fatigue or they, you know, they, they can't remember things. And the physician basically can't do much. And a lot of that is because those conditions aren't defined. There's just vague symptoms. There's not actually a biological signature of the symptom. We did find that for people with neurological issues like brain fog, that you could measure out of the blood signatures that said that their circadian sleep cycle was disrupted. And then we found that people that had um, sort of respiratory viral things like flu and, and chills, things like this, a cough, that they had um, repressed what's called cortisol, repressed cortisol levels. And, um, and a, a major motivation of trying to dig through our data to find those, and I tell you, there's not a lot there, but we did find that, um, was to help begin to define this disease in the clinical setting so that patients are not just having vague complaints. You can actually say there is something biologically off in these patients. Um, and those two findings actually make a lot of sense. And even one of them is uh, suggests a treatment. Um, but nevertheless, when the patients were recovered, very little in our massive data set um, could we assign to these different symptoms. And so we started going back in time and asking, what is it at acute disease? Or what is it when they're initially diagnosed? Can we actually identify things that anticipate that they're going to develop long COVID symptoms? And that's when we began to resolve quite a bit. And, um, and it's, in fact, it's pretty remarkable. You know, we found that almost all of the patients that we had that were complaining of, let's say, you know, maybe three or more long COVID symptoms, we probably looked for around 20 or so. So if you have one, you know, you're not really sure that's kind of vague, but three, you say that's something probably is actually wrong with this person. Um, we found that there were four factors that we could measure at diagnosis or even before diagnosis that... Um, anticipated the development of these long COVID symptoms. And, um, and those four, uh, one, not too surprising, was type two diabetes. And probably why we resolve that as, a, and we also see some, like if you had previous serious heart issues, that is an issue, but that's very few patients. Type two diabetes, we had, I don't know, out of our 200 patients, plus another 100 from UW, probably 40 or so patients. Um, so really the statistics to resolve it. Um, we found, we looked for reactivated viruses that had been latent that were reactivated by COVID-19. And we found evidence for one of them, Epstein-Barr virus, which is commonly associated with mononucleosis, uh, 
you know, teenagers get that kissing disease, but it leads to symptoms that are pretty reminiscent to long COVID, you know, uh, fatigue and things like this uh, knocks you on your back for quite a while. We found um, that the blood level, not the nasal swab level, but the blood level of SARS-CoV-2 mRNA, the, the, the genetic signature of the virus in the blood at diagnosis also anticipated uh, long COVID symptoms. And the most important thing we found is that patients who had autoantibodies at diagnosis, mature autoantibodies, indicating that they had those before they were ever infected, right. um, had a good chance of, of having uh, long COVID symptoms. Yeah, those were some really concrete findings. And you, you know, it's interesting to hear how the study developed because it's interesting that you were just studying acute COVID first and then you sort of just iterated, obviously, and just started to work uh, as you started to realize what was occurring with long COVID. But it seems like you already were able to test some of the core trends that were going to matter. In other words, the reactivation of viruses, uh, potential herpes virus reactivation, the autoantibodies. In other words, you had those trends on your radar so that you could do um, that analysis. That impressed me because exactly, you started the study so long ago that it seems like it was very, um, you know, very good of you to notice those factors right away. Um, I'm curious with the autoantibodies, when I was reading the study, it interested me that you obviously saw signs of Epstein-Barr virus reactivation in some of the patients. And then some of the autoantibodies that you identified, the lupus autoantibodies specifically, um, have you seen that some of those are actually mimics for, um, in other words, Epstein-Barr's protein EBNA1 is actually a mimic for some of the lupus autoantigens. So there could almost be a molecular mimicry scenario that happens there. We did see in, in a different setting, we did see uh, what, what one might think of a molecular mimicry. We didn't really see, you know, we looked for, like if you have EBV reactivation, are you more likely to have certain autoantibodies? Right. We don't see that, but that doesn't mean it's not there. We just might not have had a big enough study to, to see that. Um, you know, I, there's a national study going on in which we're uh, leading a Pacific Northwest component of it which will look at 17,000 patients. And that would be enough to begin resolving yeah. such a trend. The cortisol that we saw, uh, so we saw this cortisol, cortisol mm -hmm. deficiency, that can be um, caused by patients taking steroids because of molecular mimicry. Steroids and cortisol look similar. Yes. We, that's not the case when, they're at, when the patients are recovered and they have low cortisol. There's no steroid relationship but there is for sure at acute disease. That was the consideration. And to be clear, you also, you tracked patients who had been hospitalized for COVID, but there was also a significant number of patients who had not been hospitalized, correct? So you were able to look at, you were able to measure um, these different things in patients with uh, hospitalized and sort of mild and even asymptomatic cases? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we corrected our observations for disease severity. So when I, talk about those four PASC factors, mm -hmm. you know, if you have serious disease, it does put you at higher risk for long COVID, but it's not dramatically higher risk. And, and, and so when we corrected for, um, I think we corrected in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, as you, when you send a paper in like this, the referees all have their different opinions on how you should correct for your, your, for your observations. Um, but no matter how we corrected for it, these four factors um, came out be, being important. Um, and so, so it's, it it's is very a pretty interesting. robust finding. Yeah. The lupus is, yes. is, is the connection you brought up is very striking as well, because, you know, that was a guess on our part. Um, and, and it was a, it was an educated guess when we looked at, um, acute disease in the paper we published a year and a half ago, we found evidence for B cells that, so generally your B cells, which make antibodies, they will travel into your uh, uh, certain lymph nodes, B cell follicles, mm -hmm. and that's where they mature. That's where they actually learn how to make antibodies. Um, but sometimes B cells won't do that. They, ha they have a, a, they'll actually mature independent of this normal pathway. And it's not obvious those antibodies are, are, are worse. I'm not sure if they are. I actually, I can't tell you. But 
but it has a very different type of B cell maturation. And you see this in lupus patients. And so we had seen this in some of the COVID patients, and that made us look for lupus-related antibodies in these patients. Um, and sure enough, um, they're, they're there, and they're, they're strong um, uh, predictors of, of long COVID. There's other autoantibodies, too. Um, right. We looked at interferon-type um, type antibodies. And now we're looking for, at the whole proteome of, of autoantibodies, because I think... Um, it's probably relevant, you know, we, we don't know yeah. yet. Yes, definitely. Cause it, it is interesting when you see that different sort of B cell divergence that's common to lupus. And that you also saw in some of these patients here, um, I guess from, so I'm a, a PhD and I've researched the role that pathogens play in, in so-called autoimmune conditions and Epstein-Barr virus is, is under study in lupus, right? And you, I, I'm sure you saw the recent studies connecting multiple sclerosis to Epstein-Barr virus activity, right? Including one study where there was that mimicry phenomenon where they were able to show that um, in, in immunoglobulin from MS, cereal spinal fluid was targeting an Epstein-Barr protein and kind of cross-reacting with the glial protein that was, you know, involved in MS. So there is this interesting way development that I realize you can tease out and you need a higher number of subjects and all that, where you can correlate some of the trends in lupus or the so-called autoimmune conditions um, that are already being tied to infectious agents to uh, the infectious contributions to long COVID. In other words, it all does overlap. I thought that was interesting with your findings. Exactly. I mean, that lupus paper, I mean, sorry, the MS paper you 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 mentioned, yeah. I think that came out like the same week our paper did, and it came out in science or something. And, you know, very striking study. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we found also is that, so these different, what we call PASC factors, you know, PASC mm -hmm. being post-acute sequela of COVID-19, so factors that anticipate long COVID, um, what we found is that they anticipate different symptoms. So the viruses, the viral load in the blood of SARS-CoV-2 or the reactivation of EBV tended to more associate with neurological things like memory fog and things like this, which you know, kind of ties together. And the autoantibody is more like respiratory viral inability to exercise, things like that, um, which I guess is not surprising, you know, given the broad heterogeneity of long COVID symptoms you expect there's probably multiple causes and you're looking at multiple conditions. Um, but it's actually nice to see that begin to resolve itself as we begin looking for um, potential therapeutic interventions. Absolutely. Yes. Because I agree that it seems unlikely that every patient with long COVID has the exact same thing happening. Uh, there's such a wide spectrum of symptoms and different things that we can be going on, but your study was able to capture some of these core trends and also divide patients into some subgroups based off symptoms and findings that I agree is such so important to provide clarity for clinical trials, for any kind of sort of approach moving forward in which you need a well-defined cohort of patients to be able to test any kind of intervention, uh, intervention or, or effect. So that was actually very cool to see. Well, one um, thing that we found that um, is more of a, a physical picture, but I think it's really interesting from the point of view of, of, of how this is looked at clinically, is that when we asked in the patients at diagnosis who had these different PASC factors, we asked at diagnosis, can you pull out of the sort of massive data cloud we collected on these patients, relationships between those past factors, relationships between the different autoantibodies, between diabetes and viruses, whatever. And it turns out you actually see quite a bit. And what that suggests to you is that there may be a handful of treatments that are relevant for, for this, but not an infinite number. But when you try to look at the relationships between those past factors, when the patients have actually developed long COVID, they're completely unrelated. And, um, and, and you, would, you would guess, if you're looking at that point, that you almost need as many different drugs as you need patients. Of course, that's wrong, but that's what you would think. Um, mm -hmm. And the way one thinks about this and it really is a physics type of pro, uh, thinking, is that in many ways, your body will take a 
let's say that um, I take 10 people that get COVID and they all differ a little bit in their start. They're different ages, maybe different sex, different ethnic, different comorbidities. They all look pretty similar initially, but over time they'll diverge from each other tremendously. And this is why it's so hard for physicians to understand what's going on when they have a patient coming in complaining of chronic fatigue or memory loss or whatever, you actually have to go back in time and get those sort of root causes. And that's where you're going to have the most success and in, in, in understanding how to treat, I think. Otherwise, you're just treating symptoms, and that's never that satisfactory. Yes, that's an interesting consideration because we've been, I've been working with research teams that we've been studying myalgic encephalitis and MECFS, which is a condition initiated or exacerbated by infection that has a lot of overlap with long COVID. But we usually get patients 20 years away from disease onset or initial infection. And so over time, it can be very hard to, you know, basically measure, especially in the blood, many of the factors that may be contributing to the disease process, we're not sure how often they're present in blood anymore. For example, you know, I'm curious with the with the EBV, I mean, with actually the SARS-CoV-2 viremia that you were able to measure in blood, you were able to do that in acute disease, but then once the patients reached about two to three months, you no longer really found virus in the blood itself, right? No, that's true for um, EBV as well. Yes, but do you wonder then that maybe the virus moved more into tissue um, and, and that was not true. in the blood? Yeah, just because, for example, herpes virus is being neurotrophic or whatever, you imagine that they're going to kind of sneak back into the nervous system where they're less likely to be targeted. So then you may miss this window where you're able to capture what might be actually happening in blood during the most acute type phase of onset, right? If you don't study the patients yeah, at that point. That's right. If you, if you, we knew this, well, I didn't wouldn't have known this ahead of time, but we talked to some virologists and they said, well, if you do have virus in the blood, it's going to be crazy transient. And so you have to capture it just in those few days when it, because otherwise it's just going to go to the tissue and you won't see it in the blood anymore. And that's exactly what we see. It's almost an exponential decay over time of this virus, but you do see it you know, early on. Um, and, um, and that makes me think, you know, if you're going to study like Lyme and you think this may be happening in Lyme, you want to study that in patients right when they come in with their, with their tick bite um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, otherwise, you're just, it's like you said, you, you're looking so late. You know, you're, everything you're looking at is a worst out. You've got defense mechanisms, you've got compensatory responses you you're missing your main signature initially um you know the 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 value of doing longitudinal studies is 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 high here you know and capturing it as early as possible yes for curiosity are you going to continue to track these patients or are you the same cohorts with some of them but we're also you know in the process of enrolling uh, uh something like a thousand patients here um to as part of this national study um and um and and that will be uh integrated with you know a thousand patients that are collected in other parts of the united states and and many different locations so that's how we get that seventeen thousand number um so hopefully we'll, but but with the like with the study that we did you know we're no longer sort of fishing we actually kind of know what we're looking for. And so we can do a much more um, a much more focused analysis, really trying to understand, for example, how does a particular autoantibody um, affect the immune response and, and, and the recovery? And is there a way to cor correct for that impact? Yeah, that's great. Um, have you seen a couple of the other trends that have emerged in long COVID? There's some evidence that there may be clotting in blood patient coagulation of blood, also potentially, you know, there's some microbiome imbalance in the gut, oral microbiome might become more dysbiotic, and then there might be leakage of, you know, sort of pro-inflammatory factors into blood. Do you think you can measure any of those factors as well and sort of correlate them also with the autoantibodies and other metrics that you're doing in your study? Yeah, so one of our big regrets is that, and I figured you were going to ask about microbiome. <laughs> 
um, is that we actually did not <laughs> measure the microbiome on the patients that we studied. We on, on a few of them we did, but basically we didn't capture it uh, quantitatively um, across the board. I think it's actually really important, and um, and uh, I guess maybe I should tell you a little bit how we think about different sets of measurements. So. You know, what's happened during the last two years is that measurements that were previously exotic and limited to a couple of labs have now become almost commodities. And these measurements are, uh, the, the word I use is they're complete. So you're measuring the complete transcriptome of single cells, or you're measuring um, the complete microbiome or the complete genome. Um, and even the ones that are less complete, like the proteome or the metabolome, are actually pretty pretty impressive. They're 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 nearly complete. Like we're measuring three thousand proteins per per patient now, and we're measuring a thousand metabolites. So what that allows you to do is not just do correlations, but it allows you to say look at the same say metabolic processes at the microbiome level, at the metabolome level, at the protein level, at the genome, et cetera. And so you can actually put together a causal framework from all of these data sets. And you know, we published one paper last year in Nature Biotech, just beginning to do this kind of thing. But um, it's like putting on a new pair of glasses. You know, you, you really resolve what's going on in these patients at a much, it's, it's the, 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 the sum of the data is much greater than the parts. Yes. When you, when you look at it this way, and I, I think it's a it's almost a sea change for how people are going to think about um, understanding biology. I agree. It's really amazing how I went to a conference just a couple years ago, and single cell sequencing was just it was tepid. People were thinking about doing it a couple times, maybe here and there, and then the amount of single cell seq you just did in this one study it's so awesome. Um, you really, <laughs> no, I, I, I think with the PPMCs, you see, I don't know how many, it was really cool. Um, so yeah, so you really took advantage of some of these methods and just went for it with the study, which is, I agree. And then I, you know, I agree if you can capture this data and then you really have the ability to start to correlate these different, you know, usually disconnected factors that are often studied in different labs that are completely segregated and you can actually start to integrate that. That seems to be a very good approach to the way you're studying. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's where we're putting in a lot of our bets right now. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think it's, if you, you know, basically like in a paper we published, even, you know, we measured all these things and we tried to tell a story, but we're only barely tapping into the data right. because there's so much data there. And so one really, it's, it means that you, your computational approaches for handling this type of data set, for really mining it for the value that it holds are limiting right now. Yeah, and, I know. And that's, that's, that's a, you know, it, it, that's going to get better and then measurements will get better, et cetera. But it's, it, it is a, it's how basically computation and experiment drive each other in this field. Yes. And it helps when other teams jump in and people are adding to databases and you know, it's, um, that's why it becomes such an important collective effort for everyone to get going and start to add to the shared amount of uh, database knowledge or whatever that, that people can draw from. So it was good to see that happen. Um, I have a question. So, you know, one of the possible topics that that a couple of our teams are actually studying is this viral reservoir. The possibility that in some patients with long COVID, they may not have fully cleared the virus, but we do not expect it to be in the blood if that's the case. We expect there could be a little bit of virus in uh, tissue of tissue lining of the gut, or perhaps still in the tissue of the lung. Um, is there any way that your team would begin to collect tissue samples or do anything? along those lines to try to figure that out. In other words, to move, I mean, you're doing plenty with analysis of blood, but do you have any plans to collect other sample types? Um, so as part, of, as part of the big national study, the, the RECOVER study, there mm -hmm. is an autopsy cohort that will look at um, patients, whether they died of COVID or whether they died of something else but had had COVID. And the goal is to do exactly that. 
to understand, are there tissue reservoirs for where this virus may reside and, and can that be detected? Because um, you know, no matter how hard you look at blood, you're still trying to infer what's going on in tissues. Right. And um, right. and blood is always a, you know, it's a it's an echo of the tissue, but sometimes it's a fairly weak echo. You need to really be looking at both. Agreed. I mean, you can infer from what you did with the T cell sequencing, and when you start to especially sort of characterize what the immune system is doing, that may reflect some of what's happening in tissue. But then the pathogens themselves, the genetic material of SARS-CoV-2 or EBV or something seems unlikely to be in the blood. So that's fair. And that's, I agree. I've seen that Recover is planning to collect tissue samples and that's cool. That would be a, another thing that you can integrate. Right. Because yeah, yeah. it's the same type of analysis that we did on blood, you can now do on tissue. You can take every single cell and tissue and do it. I mean, if you really want to and get the whole transcriptome, you can get the epigenome. Um, you know, it, you can do crazy deep analyses and all that stuff has become available in the last few years. Um, it's, it really is a new world when, um, I think if you think about one of the really big challenges in understanding biology, um, has been that biology is high, highly heterogeneous and, and these single cell methods really let you capture that you know, get rid of that or, you know, resolve that heterogeneity in, in a very compelling fashion. You still got the time axis and other stuff that you're going to have to worry about, but still major step forward. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, I'm not sure. Have you seen the studies that show that patients with long COVID have a high incidence of small fiber neuropathy? I saw, I've seen that a little bit. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of anxious to see how that gets tracked down. Because a lot of these studies, um, still the bulk of long COVID studies are still largely derived from clinical measures or epidemiological studies, things like this. But, um, but they're really beginning to define some of these you know, deeper dives, like the kind of things that, we, that we've been doing and, and other, other groups like us. So yeah. it's, it's a, you know, and, and a, a, a big part of this I, and you alluded to it before, a big part of this is that this pandemic has led to a level of sharing of data, um, which everybody always said they did, but I'm not really sure <laughs> everybody did it so well. And now um, it's, it's really become the culture. Um, and I hope that stays the culture. I think it's very important. Um, and the other part of the pandemic that was just crazy useful for um, exposing, you know, a lot of the knowledge that we've learned is the fact that patients were willing to come in and give their time and blood and et cetera in ways that um, you really hadn't had that before, except for maybe HIV or something like that. But, but, but it, it, you know, it takes every, all these, all these pieces have to come together for the science to, to resolve what it's resolving. I agree. Patients have been amazing for most of our studies where they you know, feel extremely ill and still say, look, I'll show up, I'll, I'll be there, you know, go ahead and get it. I'll get a biopsy done, even anything like that, which has been very, very, very helpful. We find that with most patients with the diagnoses we study, maybe it's not a good thing. There seem to be a lot of long COVID patients. I'm not sure that that's, so we have, you know, been, had excellent success with recruitment of long COVID. The only thing that makes me feel bad is I feel like part of that is because there's so many patients who are getting long COVID. But Absolutely. other than that, it's been, it's been very cool to see the, the participation of patients in the research. Absolutely. Um, yeah, when we, I think we announced our study, um, once we, our, our sites were opened, we put a press release out and we had like in the first weekend, like a hundred people um, inquire about signing up for the study that's there's a lot of long COVID out there and you know most people aren't going to look at these sites where our study was announced it's it's impressive right. the response yes I know I agree um yeah the um type 2 diabetes which was one of the factors that you found predisposed towards long COVID I thought that was interesting too because in diabetes, the small fiber neuropathy that I mentioned is now being documented a lot in long COVID. 
that's very common in type 2 diabetes, so peripheral neuropathy. So there seemed to be some overlap there. Um, and also sort of clotting or coagulation of blood has been noted in some studies with patients with diabetes. And there's some indications that there may be some of those issues in long COVID. So there obviously seems to be this trend as well that which you're tapping into, I think, where if someone already was developing something in the background in a sense, and it was subclinical, maybe type two diabetes, they had, you know, beginnings of neuropathy, beginning of some potential coagulatory issues, anything like that, perhaps even Epstein-Barr involvement in some fashion into the lupus mimicry for autoantigens. And then, but the symptoms hadn't yet been overt, but then they get COVID and it's this hit to the immune system and perhaps that sort of the condition that they had now manifest along with potential other factors as well. But you're kind of picking up on the fact that there may have already been things happening in patients and COVID was the turning point. Does that seem oh, that's fair absolutely, to you? In fact, that's absolutely true. So when we looked, when, and, and I think the most clean example is with the autoantibody measurements we did. So if you let's say had a hundred people randomly selected and had them measured for autoantibodies using like a lab core assay. Mm -hmm. The lab core assay comes back and it's going to say maybe two or four percent of these people have elevated autoantibodies. But the lab core assay has a cutoff where above which you expect to have clinical symptoms associated with the autoantibodies, below which they don't report it. And so when we looked, we, we looked, we just asked, do you have autoantibodies? Um, and, or, and so if you're in the top, if you had them, it turns out it's a risk. Um, but they're subclinical, but, but they are becoming clinical at some level as the patients develop long COVID. Um, and so and we've had some confusion with physicians about this because physicians say, well, gosh, you've got more patients with autoantibodies than, than we would expect. Well, well, yeah, because we 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 actually reported. I, I think like LabCorp is going to come back with the top 0.01 percent, and we and we report like the you know if you're one percent above above a healthy background or something like that. Um, in any case, um, you know most of those autoantibodies are patients had them before they were subclinical. Patients did not have autoimmune disease or anything like that, but um, it manifests. It becomes clinical. With this, uh, with with COVID nineteen, yeah, that's uh, definitely something that your study uh, helped me just actually see in terms of data. Um, and you know, I think um, one of the things when it comes to that, um, I guess then when it comes to potential therapeutics, are you does this? What are you thinking? I mean. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to go there, but if you had to consider some things that might be clinical child uh, off this, what are you, what are your thoughts? Well, the, there's some low apples here, and and mm -hmm. I know one of them is, you know, antivirals really early in the disease course, which are being tried already because of the Merck and and um, and Novartis antivirals. Um, those will affect at least SARS-CoV-2. Um, EBV, which is the DNA virus, probably you've got to have to try something different. Um, right. And there are there are antivirals that might work. Um, the repressed cortisol that we see in patients with respiratory issues, uh, respiratory flu-like issues, that's oftentimes thought of as what's called Addisonian disease. And this cortisol replacement therapy seems to be effective for at least some of those patients. Um, we, I think the deeper questions are, have to do with these autoantibodies, which are by far the most important of these past factors. Um, and in fact, when we look at the patients with the highest level of autoantibodies, they do have worse long COVID. So they they do, they are functional. Okay. Um, and so mm -hmm. right now, for example, to, as far as the lupus connection, we, uh, we've taken a, a small subset of our patients, but we're looking very deeply at both the epigenome and the transcriptome of their B cells, um, trying to understand how 
these autoantibodies are impacting B-cell maturation processes? And is there a, a target there? I have no idea if there is or not, but it's the clearest signature we have of what these, uh, the impact of these autoantibodies. And so we we're diving deep. Um, but I think there's a number of other strategies that people are beginning to, to explore. I, um, there's certainly going to be a demand for, you know, patients who want to have some sort of treatment rather than just, you know, two aspirin call me in the morning. And, um, and, you know, it could be that there's existing drugs that would work, existing treatments that would work. And we just haven't thought about how to effectively use them here. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's, yeah, I think that, you know, us and other p groups are going to be looking at this very seriously over the next, uh, 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 you know, foreseeable future. It's amazing. Yeah. And one of the things that you bring up that a lot of people are saying is that perhaps when it's most important to treat for long COVID is during acute COVID. In other words, treat right away to prevent chronic symptoms from developing in the first place. That seems to be a really important trend to consider. Yeah, well, it's the same argument for, you know, you want to get vaccinated and boosted. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's your best protection against long COVID also. <laughs> it's whatever you can do exactly to not get COVID or when you get COVID to have whatever. And yeah, to have an immune that... response that's basically protective and, and is, yes. you know, and, and, and if, if you are unfortunate enough to get long COVID or to get, you know, a, a serious acute infection, then, you know, coming up with treatments early on, I think is the strategy. I mean, there's not a disease for which that's not true, right? If you treat cancer early on, you're going to have better luck with it. And I think that that's, that's across the board, just how to think about it. Yeah, I agree. And last, you know, there are obviously a lot of long COVID patients who go to the, their doctor right now and the doctor does some, you know, standard blood work and they say, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, I think that it is interesting to think of the difference of what can be measured on a clinical test in a doctor's office right now and what you are able to measure in your study. So how do you think we can begin to bridge that gap sooner than later, where we obviously can do a research study and start to do all kinds of sequencing and understand these relationships? How can we translate that to a point where patients can go to the clinician and they will actually say, we can find something wrong with you. Well, one thing that would be, it's a good point. One thing that would be useful would be to at least um, collect a blood aliquot from patients um, when they're diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And um, because then you can go back and look and like these, these viral measurements we do out of the blood, they're not that crazy different from a, from a nasal swab test. Right. Um, but they are different and you gotta, you gotta do them differently, but you can still do them in a, in a, say a lab core like strategy. Um, and the same thing is true for autoantibodies, just because the standard clinical labs may not report back subclinical levels of autoantibodies doesn't mean that they don't have that information or that it can't be easily measured. I mean, the assays we do, we, you know, we look at a hundred patients at a time at a time and we're an academic lab. Um, it's the kind of thing that can readily be adapted into into a um, you know a, a a a larger strategy for 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 such a thing, um, and I think it's the kind of thing that you know patients maybe should demand. It costs very little to like save a, a, a milliliter of blood and and you know for for looking at later, um, and it's a nice insurance policy if you're trying to wonder you know, what the cause of my long COVID symptoms are, and if there's a strategy, a therapeutic strategy that can be effective against that, that cause. Um, you know, anyway, I think a lot of the things can easily be adapted into clinical labs. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, clinical labs have as opposed to this sort of revolution in biological techniques that we talked about clinical lab kind of stayed the same. <laughs> That's what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> As we see uh, so much advancement in sequencing and transcriptomics, and then the clinical stuff just seems to be percolating. So there also seems like an opportunity and hey, why not for long COVID and COVID to begin to iterate some of that into the clinic as well. Because 
or, and especially in the meantime, for physicians who are just doing the standard clinical testing to be very aware that what they can pick up on is extremely limited. Um, so don't right. send the patient away saying there's nothing wrong with you. Just say our tools probably, you know, our tests probably can't pick up what's wrong with you. <laughs> right, right. Because I think it's yeah. very, very discouraging for patients to yeah. be told there's nothing wrong with you when they know there's something yeah. wrong with them. Exactly. Yeah. So there's lots of potential in that space there to innovate as well. And then uh, finally, well, all right. So your plans for moving forward are just recruit this whole other big cohort of patients and keep going? To that and, um, and we're also, you know, doing very deep dives now that we know quite a bit on, on a subset of the patients that are, um, that we think are going to give us the most interesting results. Uh, based upon um, you know actionable those most actionable results, and we have those 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 samples stored in our biobank. Um, and you know before the pandemic, I'm actually sort of a cancer researcher, but we were planning to do a um, a study of Lyme disease, post acute Lyme. And based on what I know now, um, we're hopefully going to do that, but it's going to be a crazy different study. Actually, a much simpler study. We actually yeah. know exactly what to look for now. And so, okay. so I think we're the way we're looking at these sort of chronic diseases that you know develop after some sort of immune insult. Um, I think it's, and these are sort of the nameless diseases. I think yeah. I think these are the. This is where there's going to be some very exciting science and and I think clinical translation over the next a few years, and hopefully we'll be part yeah. of that. I'm so glad to hear you're going to do that with Lyme, with the chronic Lyme or post in Lyme. I mean, it's it's an untapped area that few people seem to just be doing the obvious, which would be these kinds of studies. I do think there it's important to collect tissue samples because there yeah, we very tissue. much know that Borrelia or Bartonella are just love connected tissue to a point where <laughs> if you don't check in there, you might miss that signal. But other than that, it would be amazing to just see a lot of what you did here just applied to the post in line. I agree. So yeah. that's exciting. Cool. Um, well, great. All right. Well, Jim, um, you definitely, you know, this study provided a lot of clarity. I think that there were a lot of trends dancing around in long COVID, a lot of things that seemed anecdotally obvious or somewhat clear based on logic, but your study was one of the first to just really document things in a concrete fashion. And it really helps other research teams to have this so that we can now see what you found and also iterate off your findings to be able to work forward. So I commend you for moving so quickly. I was just impressed at the amount of work and the amount of different analyses you were able to get done on these patients. It's really remarkable. Well, we had a really good team here working on it, but thank you. I can tell. Cool. All right. Well, maybe I can have you come back in some time and you can update me further on uh, your other developments, but yeah, I when really we get our appreciate microbiome that. on these patients, we can talk. Yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome, especially just because, you know, even if obviously there's microbiome imbalance, I'm going to call it in the gut or the oral cavity, you have that potential leakage of some of the products, the metabolites, even the byproducts of that into the blood where you can begin to correlate that with some of the immune uh, measurements. And I see so much potential there to not, you know, assume, in other words, not assume everything is just coming from sort of self, sterile self attack, but that there may be, you know, components from all these organisms in and on us that are part of at least part of some of what the immune system is contending with. So, Absolutely. yeah. I mean, there's massive metabolic dysregulation of these patients and the microbiome yes. has to be engaged in that. And Exactly. It almost has to be. It's just, there's so much uh, metabolic in input from the, you know, if you want to call it like super organism or whatever you want to call humans, where we're so intricately connected to the metabolism of our microbes that if you, it's almost impossible to dissociate. So I agree. You should definitely do that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, good talking All to right. You. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.